It is my pleasure to start and to warm you up with uh, patient flow indications and the current status of guideline and um, uh, indication uh, statements from the uh, societies so far. We all are here because we believe that thrombus formation in the left atrium, uh, in the left atrial appendage is one of the major drivers for stroke and embolism and atrial fibrillation and the mechanical solution uh, is easy from its concept. These are the two current um, mainly used devices, the Amplatza cardiac plug and the Watchman occluder, but it's not that easy to implant it and to find the correct indication and I think that's the driver behind this um, very successful meeting so far. Um, I want to touch the following topics. First, give a short overview about the clinical data of the occluder implantation and then go to three aspects, some considerations, occluder versus current systemic anticoagulation, the current indications uh, in the AF guidelines. John has already shown you the, the main uh, picture and some a really preliminary um, um, slide from the consensus statement, which is which is in preparation. Uh, so it's a preliminary um, um, slide. I think this was a groundbreaking trial, the Protect AF trial, uh, a prospective randomized trial. You all know the data, but um, it was really an initiator in in a evidence-based medicine-driven world that. The occluder, in terms of endpoint efficacy, was not inferior to a control group. A really, very, very important data set um, in terms of efficacy. Uh, and the efficacy point was, um, was um, approved in future. This is a list of, of registries and data set. Um, which followed the Protect AF trial. In some, we have around 1,000 patients followed and uh, studied in registries. You see uh, two watchman uh, registries. You see the Amplatza cardiac plug, European post-market observational study, Belgian registry, single center experience. So um, taken together around 1,000 patients where we have follow-up data and clinical events. And when we take a look to the efficacy, uh, we have an observed stroke rate in these registries and a stroke risk. There are no control groups which are calculated, calculated risk. And we come back to this 65 to 77 percent reduction rate, which is close to what we know from warfarin um, and its potency to reduce stroke. So I think it's a confirmation of, um, of the Protector F trial even in real world registries in these two data sets, no strokes and only one TIA uh, were reported. So I think the efficacy part is, is confirmed in, in around 1,000 patients. We all know that we have a difficult area with the occluder implantation which is the acute safety, the complication during the procedure I think this was the area where we had to really under, well, we, where we had to improve the results. This is the Watchman Protect AF data, and you see 6% series events. This was the initial European experience with the Amplatza cardiac plug, same level, 7%, with significant complications. We had five tamponades, two device embolizations, and three ischemic strokes. And I think we all felt that this is far too high um, as a complication rate, acute complication rate to, to roll out such, uh, such a procedure. But there is a good news uh, and this is documented um, by this sequence of data. You see December 2008 to 2009, the initial European registry with this uh, already stated uh, complication rate and the next data set, 2009 to 2011, has already shown a significant reduction uh, in, uh, in adverse events and of importance is we had no strokes in this data set, three tamponades, so a reduction here, three device embolization. I think all these two complications have 
have normally no long-term consequences for the patient. They can be managed, but the stroke um, uh, is really serious. So I think a big step forward to reduce the acute complication, and this is, um, this is the field of education, these meetings, hands-on proctorship programs, and I think here is the right concept behind, behind the therapy. And also the watchman, when you take the initial study of the protect AF study, and you compare it in terms of safety to the uh, follow-up registry, uh, also in this data that there was a reduction of the acute device-related and procedure-related adverse events from 7.7% down to 3.7%, so same, um, same amount of reduction in the acute uh, setting. Let me briefly come to systemic anticoagulation, uh, and I think warfarin has done a tremendous job. It has uh, it has a history. It was found by Carl uh, Link, uh, and it had a first career as a rat killer, a premium rat killer, and then it turned into an uh, anticoagulation drug, and summarizing its effect, studied in, in many, many trials, mainly in the 90s. Warfarin versus placebo has this 70% um, stroke reduction rate. Again, this uh, reduction we've also found in many um, occluder uh, studies so far. We all know there are weak sites. Uh, we have this narrow therapeutic range. We have to individualize it, and we are always threatened by the risk of bleeding when we move out of this narrow range of 2.0 to 3.0, uh, and we know when we are outside this therapeutic range in more than 50% of the times, uh, even mortality uh, is increased when we perform anticoagulation. And the final um, result in clinical reality, and I think this is a very important um, uh, data set here, is that the compliance to therapy after three years is around 50%, irrespective how important anticoagulation is. You see even chats three, four, five patients who really need anticoagulation to be protected, they are off this drug at a level of 50% after three years for various reasons. There might be pleading patient's compliance. Uh, so, but the, the result is uh, that we lose many patients and, and, uh, and they are in their real risk arena without anticoagulation. You may say the new anticoagulants are, this is the new world and this, this, this will solve all our problems. But when we take a look to major bleeding and we go to dibicardine 150 milligram, which is the recommended dosage because of its superiority in risk reduction, you see we have a 3.11% per year bleeding rate, which is really close and statistically not different from what we see with warfarin. So systemic anticoagulation will, will, uh, will have a considerable risk of bleeding. I think this is part of the systemic concept. So when we just take a look to the weak points, I won't go into details here, we have the GI bleeding issue which is increased with the new drugs. We have renal insufficiency which is a major issue, especially in the combination with the elderly patients who have various forms um, um, of, of renal insufficiency. We have the issue of traumatic severe bleeding, we have the issue of triple anticoagulation therapy in coronary artery disease patients, all stent patients need antithrombotic treatment on top of their anticoagulation, and we know this increases the risk of bleeding significantly. We have drug-drug interaction, and I think this is a point for the daily practice. We are not really familiar now. We have to have a daily drug intake dependence with the new drug. So if you make a pause of one or two days, um, the risk uh, may start very early on when you have um, a non-compliant patient who takes his drugs one day and he, who doesn't the next one. John has already shown you this slide. The LA Ogluda was uh, now first mentioned in the guidelines. Um, may be considered in patients with a high stroke risk and contraindications for long-term or oral anticoagulation. It's a 2B um, recommendation, so it is mainly left to the physician's decision whether he goes this way or not, and it's a level of evidence B, so the protector F trial is the only randomized trial. When we go to the text, I think it, it's good to read this little text. Uh, they are, they, the, the guidelines mention 
uh, several weak points of the whole thing. They say, Evidence of efficacy and safety is currently insufficient to recommend this approach for any patients other than those in whom long-term OAC is contraindicated. I think we need more data. This is something for the companies, for the societies. I think we really need more controlled prospective trials in that field. Um, so the next sentence says, in the absence of controlled clinical data, this recommendation is based on experts' consensus only. This is a sentence, John, I don't understand because we have the PROTECT-AF trial. So there is at least one prospective randomized trial, uh, but we need additional adequately powered randomized studies. I think this is, this is, um, this is um, uh, clear. And the need for lifelong aspirin treatment after placement of LAA closure devices and the significant pleading risk with aspirin may weigh against preference for interventional LAA occlusion. And this is a point. We have to keep these patients so far on aspirin. And this is a limitation because we have to go on with drugs. Maybe the future brings data that we can take them off aspirin after six months, one year, when endothelialization is completed. So at present, interventional AA occlusion is not indicated simply as an alternative to OAC therapy to reduce stroke risk. At that point, ESC and ERA um, uh, started to, to ask for, a, for more recommendation, a more detailed recommendation, and um, ask a group to perform a consensus statement. I'll show you very preliminary just one slide, which is, um, which is under discussion. And, um, and goes a little bit in, uh, into more details. Uh, this, this consensus statement is debating the following flow. You have an AF patient's indication for OAC uh, to reduce stroke and embolism, like uh, the, the indication graph John showed you, Chet's vesco. If the patient is suitable for oral anticoagulation, he should receive the drug and he should receive preferable the new or direct oral anticoagulation drugs. If you have a clear contraindication, uh, let's say life-threatening bleeding, intracranial bleeding, and you cannot remove the cause for that bleeding, um, and you cannot put that patient to any systemic form of anticoagulation, this is the area to consider left atrial appendage occlusion implantation, but you have to say it includes currently the need for antiplatelet therapy um, lifelong, so this is something you have to, to uh, take into account. There are two more groups. This is a little bit small. I will read it for you. There is a group of patients with increased risk for bleeding, and there are mainly three groups. Patients with a HESPLAT score of more or equal to three, patients with a need for a prolonged triple anticoagulation therapy, so patients who have repetitive stent implantation, have coronary bypass surgery, have um, have every two or three years receive a stent, so they, they have a long time on triple uh, anticoagulation therapy is a cohort, and patient with an increased bleeding risk which is not covered by the HUSPLAT score, like thrombopenia. We have patients with cancer disease. Uh, we, have, um, we have bowel diseases which are not covered by the, uh, by the HUSPLAT score, though these patients who could be discuss to receive an occluder. You have to perform individual risk-benefit evaluation for oral anticoagulation versus alternative treatments like the occluder implantation or no treatment. If the risk is access acceptable for systemic anticoagulation, this should be performed. If you think in your risk-benefit evaluation, uh, the systemic anticoagulation risk is too high, consider alternative tr treatment strategies and you might consider left atrial appendage occluder implantation. There's a third group, which is really a matter of debate. What, do we with, what can we do with patients who refuse anticoagulation? Say, I could take it, but I don't want to take the pill. I want to get your occluder, and, uh, and, and that's it, and then I'm fine. So the patient is refusing anticoagulation after adequate information. Um, so far, the statement is that you have strongly advised uh, the new oral anticoagulants. When the patient agrees, he will receive it. When he re refuses, 
it is a way and it is accepted to go for occluder implantation. This is really a matter of, of, of debate after adequate uh, information about the risk and benefits of this therapy. Thank you for your attention.